<laughs> oh my god, it's so fun to see all of the messages start popping in. Hi, everyone. I think we're ready to get going. So, hi, my name is Linda Menard. I'm with Niche Consulting, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see what I have to share with you today. All right. Um, could somebody just pop in the chat whether you're able to see my screen now? Great, great. Okay. Thanks so much, y'all. Um, it's a little funny not getting to see everybody. A lot of the courses that I teach, people are all on screen with me. So um, so thank you for helping me out with that. I appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lena Menard. I'm with Niche Consulting. I do small space design work, consulting, workshops, and advocacy. And I'm delighted to be here. Super excited that all of you are too. I'm a big ADU nerd. And uh, it's really fun for me to see the uptick that's happening right now in terms of ADU interest. What I'm going to be sharing with you today is some tricks and tips that I have developed uh, over the years, lots of uh, learning from other people. And I want to just note that the images that I'm using are from accessorydwellings.org, um, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Um, so if you want to see where the photo attributions are, that's where you can check. So. Um, just to tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm here, um, I have been an advocate of small spaces for a really long time. I've always loved small spaces. I moved around a lot as a kid. I have five sisters, so I got really used to being in small spaces. Um, and I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2011, lived in the first of many small spaces there um, when I was living in a tiny house on wheels while studying urban planning to get my master's degree in urban planning and focused on land use and got really into the tiny house world, including tiny houses on wheels, as well as accessory dwelling units. So it's been really fun for me to see this evolve over the last dozen or so years as I've lived in a yurt, a travel trailer, four tiny houses on wheels, three ADUs. I currently live in an ADU. I work for a design company um, and we've got an ADU on the boards right now. So there's a lot of fun uh, ADU stuff in my life. I designed and built my own tiny house on wheels twice. Um, I'm currently working to try to move one of my tiny houses and have it be an accessory dwelling unit in a new place. So that's an exciting project. I was involved with coordinating ADU and tiny house bike tours until they got so big that we had to create a separate event for them. Um, I was involved with the accessorydwellings.org website and periodically still am. Um, there's a group called the Build Small Coalition in conjunction with uh, the Oregon Debar Department of Environmental Quality. I had the opportunity to do a set of case studies. It was 60 homeowners and 20 designers and builders and then a set of thematic posts that captured the stories of ADU creation and uh, went on then to work with AARP. They've had a real interest in ADUs recently uh, because they recognize the benefits for people who are using an ADU as part of their retirement plan. So I worked on this ABCs of ADUs project in collaboration with some other people. And I also had the opportunity to work on a project with AARP Vermont uh, to do a set of case studies there too. So there's a lot of talk about ADUs these days, I'm thrilled that the Biden administration is recognizing the prospect of ADUs uh, as a potential part of the toolkit to address our current housing crisis. Um, so there's a lot happening. Really excited to be part of this work. Let's just make sure we're on the same page about what an ADU is. An ADU stands for accessory dwelling unit. In some places, they'll call it an auxiliary dwelling unit. It goes by lots of other names. Um, so I'm going to share a few examples here. First, there are some internal ADUs, um, things like basement apartments. You might also hear this called a mother-in-law, attic apartments, and also carve-outs. So this is an example um, that was we did a case study for in the accessorydwellings.org website. This couple realized they weren't using one of their um, bedrooms and one of their bathrooms. So they ended up creating this little carve out ADU, made a new staircase and little porch up to it. And now they're able to rent that out short term, which is a supplement to their income. Um, so in California, those are sometimes referred to as a JADU or a junior accessory dwelling unit. Um, and just requires a little rethinking of how to use our space well. 
This is an addition. Um, it's a little mother-in-law wing to a house that was added to a house in Vermont. Uh, this one's in Burlington, Vermont. And this couple found that they um, were in a position where they wanted to provide care for their mom without having her go into an, uh, a home for uh, retired folks. And so they added a wing to their house. So they were able to have her come and live with them. So we talked about internal. This is the version of doing an addition to the house to create an ADO. We also have examples of backyard cottages or guest houses. So the little house here is in Georgia. It's uh, in the backyard of the house that this fellow used to own. He, his kids were trying to find a place to live. And he said, what if you move into my house, I'll build myself a little uh, backyard cottage and I'll live in that. So he's able to stay on his own property and also provide housing uh, for his family and now gets to hang out with his grandkids a lot more often. There's also the carriage house or the apartment above the garage. So the Fonz is uh, you know, famous for having had this housing situation, but it's prominent in a lot of communities and a creative way to take advantage of vertical space and make a separate unit that's available for rent for friends or family, et cetera. Um, there's also the converted garage. Um, this woman, Amy, also lives in Burlington, Vermont. She converted her garage into a tiny ADU that she lives in and her friend lives in the primary dwelling. So ADUs can be created in many different ways. They're a small unit on the same property as an existing home, usually a single family home, but in some areas it's possible to do them on the same property as a duplex, a two family, a three family, a triplex, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of permutations, variations all over the country. Um, I'm hoping we have a little bit more regularized uh, legislation and, and regulations moving forward that make it much more possible, feasible, and affordable. Um, but in the meantime, that's a whole separate conversation. We're going to talk about design. So one of the first things I introduced myself, I introduced ADUs to you. We need to figure out how we're going to introduce our houses. And one of the most important things to think about when you're designing an ADU, and this goes for tiny houses on wheels too. We're going to talk about ADUs, but most of these principles apply to tiny houses on wheels too, um, is that you want your entrance to be really welcoming. You want to have a place that people can see, oh, this is the front door. <laughs> this is a place where I'm supposed to arrive. And one of the ways you can do that is as shown here in this little ADU, which is part of a, a community of uh, houses with all ADUs. The ADUs uh, was set up as condos. The ADUs all sold first. Everyone wanted the ADU, so it was awesome. Um, but in this one, the entry is tucked in a little bit from the main plane of the house. And that creates a little sense of coziness, a spot to arrive. Um, you also see porches and that's a place to arrive. So giving a welcoming entrance is an important part of designing an ADU so that people know where they're supposed to go. Along those lines, wayfinding is another important piece. Because ADUs might be in a basement or they might be in an attic, they might be tucked behind a house, um, they might be around the corner, it's important to provide some wayfinding. So having a little path, having a gate, maybe having a sign. A lot of times an ADU will be numbered, as you can see here on this one, um, 1625B. It's often B, sometimes it's half. Um, they very rarely have their very own address, but the addressing is important for the sake of fire so that the firefighters can find people if they need to. And side note, this is part of the reason that um, a ADUs that are illegal are problematic is that a lot of the ones that are undercover the fire department doesn't know about. And so it's harder to keep people safe. So to the extent possible, a lot of municipalities are now recognizing the importance of helping all of their ADUs to be legalized so that people can be safe and people can be um, able to be found if necessary. Um, so I recognize a lot of people have gone under the radar because a lot of places ADUs were not legal until recently. In some places they're still not, unfortunately. And um, there are sometimes costs to bringing them up uh, to regulations, but just want to throw that out there in terms of safety. That's why uh, so many municipalities are really working on making them legal right now. Another thing, I talk about this a lot. I tend to use the, the term landing pad, um, but in Vermont, where I live, we call this a mudroom. <laughs> and this is the place where you transition from outside to inside. So taking off your boots, your coat, your um, scarves, your mittens, whatever it might be, and 
Landing pads, this is a really simple one done by a family who created a basement ADO apartment. Their friends live upstairs. They've got a kiddo. They needed a place to corral things at the door so that their kiddo was not trooping across the house with muddy boots and dropping stuff everywhere, right? So they have this little landing pad at the front door. This is a place to hang up coats, to hang up grocery bags, to put a lunchbox, to put boots. People put their keys, their wallets, their receipts, they plug in their phone, whatever it is. Having a landing pad is a really great way in a small space to keep the things that are about going inside and out in the same place. People put an inbox here, an outbox here, a bag to go to the thrift store, recycling, compost, whatever it is, right? You can, you can really make good use of a landing pad if you design it well. One of the biggest things we can do in a small space is use an open concept, an open floor plan. The easiest thing to do is share space. If you have only one or two people living in an ADU, then if you're able to create a separation in some way with a wall for a bedroom or a screen or a loft or something like that, keeping as much of the other space open as possible and allowing that space to be shared between kitchen, dining, and living helps the small space feel larger and provide more connection all across the way. Whenever we put in walls, it starts to divvy things up. So if we can have those three rooms share space in a great room sort of concept, that works really well for a small space. We can also borrow space. So in this ADU, we have a loft upstairs and a living room and kitchen downstairs. And these spaces are distinct from each other. There's a little wire railing that's separating them, the cable railing. Um, we've got a height difference that separates these spaces but the air, the light, the sound is all borrowed from one space to another. One of the advantages of that is that it makes both spaces feel bigger than they actually are. If you can imagine with me for a moment, if we put walls up and made a solid wall, you know, that separated the staircase from the rest of the space, this would feel much smaller than it does. So borrowing space, light uh, from other spaces, heat, <laughs> cool, <laughs> can be really helpful too. And finally, we can make spaces do multiple duties. So having our spaces be flexible, having them serve multiple purposes allows us to get more out of a small space. This is the inside of that little ADU that was the garage conversion that I showed at the beginning. So it's a one car garage. This is not a very big space, but she was able to really maximize this space by having her great room serve multiple purposes. So you can see in the bottom right, this is her office. This is a single person living in this space. So when she's in this space and she's working at her desk, she's in her office. When she has a couple of friend, couple friends over and they're sitting and having a cup of tea or coffee or wine, then this is her living room. This is the place she entertains. And when it's time for her to exercise, she scoots her coffee table over, pulls out her exercise bike, and all of a sudden it's her home gym. So having a single space serve multiple purposes is a really great way to have a little space work harder. Let's talk about connections. One of the things that I think is really neat about living in a small space is that I have become a lot more aware of what's happening outside. Um, Dee Williams, who's one of my tiny house heroes, was the first one to really point this out to me. She talked about how she's much more aware of the moon patterns and the sun patterns and which way the prevailing winds blow because of living in a small space. And I have absolutely found that to be true. So I think it's really neat in this little ADU, the way it's tucked into the woods and just feels like it absolutely belongs there. But connecting elements of the inside and out, when you live in a small space, you're invited outside more. You're more tempted to go exploring. And that's one of the things I really love about being in small spaces. We can also bring the outside in. This is the inside of that Georgia ADU that I showed you that had that wraparound veranda porch. So on nice days, the owner of this ADU can open up all the doors and bring that light, that air, um, the sense of the, the plants in the yard, et cetera, bring all of that outside into the space, making the small space feel a lot bigger than it would otherwise. We can also bring the inside out. This is an ADU in Seattle, Washington. And if anybody else is from Seattle, Washington, you know there aren't a lot of absolutely glorious days for several months of the year, 
But when it's beautiful in Seattle, it is so beautiful. So the designer of this ADU was intentional about creating outdoor spaces that would help to create kind of an outdoor living room, outdoor dining room, so that when the weather is nice, you can be outside and enjoy kind of that bringing the inside out, having the rooms that you might be, you know, that you would have inside your house, bringing that outside and, and serving those functions outside the house. All right, let's talk about light. We can select light colors for our small spaces to help them feel brighter, feel bigger. Um, when the light gets bounced around as it does more, when our spaces are light colored, it helps the space to feel more illuminated. In this space, there's a lot of white. I personally am too klutzy to have a lot of white in my life, um, but I like yellow. <laughs> so I recently uh, repainted my little 800 square foot ground bound house, pale yellow on the inside. It's this really creamy, lovely buttery color and it brightens up the space quite a bit. So having light colors helps the space to feel bigger. We can also use both natural and artificial light. I'm a huge fan of natural daylighting. I think it's important that we have natural daylight. Um, studies show this, research shows this, we all know this. And there's so many ways we can be really strategic and thoughtful about that. We'll talk about windows in a minute. But meanwhile, there are times, and in some parts of our country, <laughs> those of us up north, we have a lot of times where we need artificial light. And so when we have artificial light that is also very strategic, it can help to ensure that we have good lighting throughout the entire day. So having daylighting so that you don't need to use artificial light as much as possible, and then also having artificial light that serves the purposes it needs to serve and helps us to be safe through safety lighting, to have ambient light for mood, to have task lighting to make sure that we can do all the things that we need to do in our homes. And finally, with lighting, we can make a statement. Um, because we won't have as many light fixtures in a small house, we can pick ones that we really like and be bold with them. Windows, let's talk windows. In an ADU, it is really important to be strategic about the placement of windows. Windows do a lot for us. They can enable us to have views to the outside, they can either allow or disallow us from having engagement with our neighbors. So we can be strategic about where to place windows for the sake of privacy. They can help us to have airflow. They can help us to have connection between inside and out. And of course they provide light as well. So if we're strategic about the placement of windows as this um, ADU designer was, as they put a corner of windows in a double height space, bringing light into a lot of the rest of the ADU, it helps us to have a real sense of spaciousness, but also to be really strategic about what it is that we see and what we don't. Whenever possible, I encourage people to light from two or even more sides. In this particular example, we can see there's a skylight, there's a sliding door and a window on one side and a window on the other. So we're having light from three sides here, which is pretty amazing in terms of helping this space to be daylit. If you cannot light from two or more sides, having a couple of windows on one side can also make a big difference. It just helps to balance the light. You don't have a single point of light. You have light coming from two places. That helps to balance the light so it's less glary. We can also be really thoughtful about which windows we're gonna make operable. Fixed windows, picture windows, the ones that don't open or close at all are less expensive and more energy efficient. So we usually start with all the windows fixed when we're doing an ADU or tiny house design and then strategically select which ones we want to operate. We absolutely have to have some windows be operable. We'll need to have egress windows, the windows that people can get out of in order to be safe if there is a fire. But if we're strategic about which windows open and which windows close, we can have access to the outdoors in all the right ways. So in this uh, ADU bedroom where they haven't yet put the bed, the bed's gonna be underneath these high windows. Those high windows provide daylight, they provide views, it gives you that feeling of being in the treetops but those windows don't need to open. In fact, it might be a little uncomfortable if they did. You don't want to draft on you. You, know, you might want the window open and fans blowing during the summer, but you don't want that feeling of draftiness. 
So they have their egress window less than 44 inches from the ground, which enables them to escape if needed. But they're strategic here about doing fixed windows in the areas where they don't need to be operable. A couple other visual tricks. One is to provide long views. When we can see across a diagonal, it makes the space stretch. It makes it seem bigger than it is. So in this ADU, there's a loft. There are a couple little rooms that tuck away and give us this curiosity about what's there. In one of those, there's a refrigerator and a pantry because they didn't want those things to be big bulky items inside the room. So they've tucked them away. Um, but then you can see the doors are, are um, glass, frosted glass. So that provides a borrowing of light as well. So this long diagonal view stretches our, you know, draws our eye up and makes the space seem a lot bigger than it might otherwise seem. Another thing that's not quite an optical illusion, but kind of sorta is doing horizontal lines. So horizontal lines draw our eye and make a space seem wider or longer. And they've used that to this, you know, to that effect along uh, the side of the house here with the horizontal siding. They've also done horizontal for the fence. And quick little side note, the patio area here is a required parking spot. Well, it is really required. It's only sort of parking spot in that they had to have it. So they made it paved and it's available should it ever need to be. But the ADU resident primarily uses the bus and there's a bus stop right around the corner. So they've used this space as a little patio. Vertical lines draw our eye upward and make spaces seem taller. And you can see as they've done here, you can mix them. You can have spaces that seem to be pulled up and spaces that seem to be drawn longer in order to make a, an ADU feel bigger. Couple quick thoughts about storage. Where do we want storage? Everywhere. <laughs> you probably won't have a storage room in your ADU. I hope you don't because I am a really big fan of putting storage where you need it and where you need it is pretty much everywhere. Put a little bit of storage in all the places you need it or a lot of storage in the places you need it. So even in a bathroom, even in a shower, we can tuck places for storage. I've seen people do storage under the stairs. The one on the left is the Harry Potter room in an ADU that a woman built for her twin sister and all the cousins run back and forth. This is before they made it into their little hideaway, but um, that's their Harry Potter room. On the right, you'll see a couple of drawers right inside the entryway tucked underneath the stairs that provide a place to put hats and gloves and mittens and scarves. We can use open shelving to enable us to show off the things we love. When you don't have as much stuff, you tend to curate what you have. You tend to keep the things you love best. So open shelving is a great way to have things within reach and be able to look at the things that you love and let the things that are part of your everyday life be practical art. We can also do built-ins. This ADU has a ton of storage because they built it in. It's not as flexible, but it does a lot of work in terms of providing storage for everything that they need to store and don't necessarily want to show off. We can use reclaimed furniture to create storage solutions. This is an ADU basement apartment, super scrappy. Um, the owner of this ADU was doing this project on the cheap and ended up finding pieces like this dining hutch and saying, this is for storing dishes. I'm gonna store dishes in it. I think it's a really clever way to go. And finally, we can use modular. This family has a kiddo. They wanted a place for her to store her things. They wanted something that would grow with her. So they put together a set of little cubbies and a rod so that she can have all of her things stored. And as she grows, they can swap these out, use them in other places and enable her to have more space that suits her current needs as she grows. So I know that was a lot. Um, hopefully there's something here that caught your eye or inspired you and that you'll find other things throughout the day that are also inspiring to you. Um, I want to take a few minutes to see if there are any questions here in the chat that we can address. It looks like there are a lot of hellos and good mornings. Um, I see I'm looking for questions. Um, oh, what is a ARP for us Canadians? Um, somebody answered that. Thank you for doing that for me, the American Association of Retired Persons. Uh, sorry for not uh, spelling that out. Thank you for getting my back. Um, somebody notes refrigerators can make noise all night long. What can we do to reduce the noise or dampen it while sleeping in open spaces? Really good question. Um, there are refrigerators that are quieter. 
So that's something you can look into. Um, it's also possible like this family did where they tucked their refrigerator into um, a little kind of closet uh, to tuck it away a little bit and create a sound barrier. Um, if you do rock wool insulation in a room and tuck your fridge in it, that will help to dampen the sound. Um, so look for refrigerators that are quieter and look for ways to place them where you're not going to have as much noise. I have one friend who built a small house and he's so noise sensitive. He actually created a separate cold, um, a little like root cellar where he keeps his fridge completely separate from his house. So that won't work for everybody, but uh, for some people who are particularly sensitive, you might just create a separate space. Um, more hellos. Hi, everyone. Um, some talking about the weather. I know it's not always gray in Seattle. I grew up there. I love it. Um, but it is sometimes gray in Seattle. Um, hello, Vegas. Um, somebody else chimes in. My tiny house is all open space. I don't hear my fridge at all. It, yeah, it really depends on the ones you have. Um, open shelving in movable tiny house alternatives. I would encourage you to take a look at what boat dwellers and um, schoolie dwellers are doing in terms of taking advantage of tricks to keep things uh, stationary or at least contained while you're traveling. I've seen some clever solutions with um, with little like tension rods to hold books in place, um, with bungee cords, um, with little nets to tuck things away. People, you know, put these little nets and stuck their like pillows and that sort of thing in there. Um, so another trick is if you have drawers, you can do little latches between the drawers that will hold them locked in place while you're in motion. Um, so if you are in a movable tiny house, um, take a look and see what boat folks, RV folks are doing. There are a lot of little tricks and tips there. Um, the most common design mistakes, that's a whole separate conversation, unfortunately, um, but hopefully um, there will be other times that we'll have a chance to talk about that. Um, how do we find an ADU space if we do not own property? Um, there is a blog post on the accessorydwellings.org website that is about how to buy or sell a property with an ADU. So check that out. Um, we're talking about fridge noise, ice and water. Okay, there's a lot about fridges here, y'all. Um, okay, there we go. Thank you, Jill, for adding the accessorydwellings.org website. And with that, we're exactly at top of the hour. I'll stop there. If you'd like to find me, you can find me at nichedesignbuild.com. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the show.